Good morning, church. Please stand and join us as we worship God. One, two, three. Day in history, death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal. You have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. The endless joy, perfect peace, the earthly pain, I finally will cease to celebrate. Jesus is alive, he's alive. Sing it out, church, and oh, happy. Wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. And oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious way. Thank you. Amen. What a happy, glorious day it is. And we're so glad that you're with us this morning. I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church. We're so happy that you're here. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and I hope that you will pray for many people on our prayer list. Um, continue to pray for Chris Bailey. I hope that you'll continue to remember him. Also, continue to pray for Shirlene Mangrum as she had her fourth uh, treatment this past Friday. And uh, she's still on the pump for today, so we need to pray for her. Also, um, ask your continued prayer for Jonathan's mother. Uh, as she's got the cancer in the brain. I hope that God would just be merciful to her. And I ask your continued prayer for my dad. It kind of got a little bit of scare yesterday, but he was not septic. He was just a little dehydrated. And uh, but uh, he, they sent him back to the nursing facility and. Uh, he has to be under quarantine now because he went out of, out of there. So, uh, But pray for him. He's just so weak and uh, we just don't know what's going to happen there. But just pray for my dad. Um, I know there's a lot of other people that are uh, traveling today and are out of town and others that are uh, 
hurting and sick around us. We need to pray for all those. Um, also pray for those who are still battling uh, this COVID stuff. Uh, I got a call this morning and one of our members uh, possibly got um, exposed this week. So they said they wouldn't be here, of course. And I said, well, I understand that. And so pray for, pray for them. I'm not going to mention any names because they may not be. Uh, but uh, just pray for all, everybody who's going through all this stuff because we need to be doing that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And also we need to give a big praise out for uh, Jonathan's little girl. who There she is. Look at that. Oh, isn't she precious? Oh, my goodness. My heart melts as I see that beautiful little face. Uh, what a head full of hair. I wish I had some of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, man, that is, she is beautiful. Absolutely precious. So continue to pray for Billy and I just ask God's blessing upon them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we are so thankful today that we can come this morning praising you, Lord, and thanking you for your mercy and grace. God, I pray today that you would just uh, be with those who are still hurting and sick. Lord, just lay your hand of healing upon them, Lord, if that's your will. Lord, I pray this morning that you would be with others who are traveling today. Lord, that you'd keep them safe and bring them home safely to us. I pray for uh, those who are uh, still having to deal with the, the COVID stuff in their life and others who are seems like constantly being exposed and I just pray for them. I lift them up to you, Lord, and pray that they would not have any symptoms and that everything would be well with them. But Lord, today I pray that you just open up our, heart, our hearts today, Lord, that we would just uh, lift our voices up in praise to you. Lord, that we would just give you a praise offering today by our worship, Lord, and that you would uh, be glorified through everything that we do here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word, and uh, not only through your word, but also through these songs that we sing. But Lord, we want you to be lifted up today, and as you're lifted up, if there's one here that doesn't know you, then I pray that you would draw them to you, and I pray that they would come and give them their lives over to you, Lord. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of quick announcements to remind you that we are, today ends our day of prayer for um, state missions and we're taking up the golden offering this week and that's what the video was about uh, this morning. I hope that you will give as the Lord lays on your uh, heart. We'll be taking that up, I'm not sure, probably through the rest of the month and maybe into the first part of next month. And then also we have, uh, it's called Project Blue, where uh, we're raising some money to uh, fix up goodie bags for police officers here in Spring Hill and in Nashville and uh, to encourage our police officers. So uh, if you, you can give to that, if you give, if you write a check, just put on their Project Blue so they'll know how to direct that money. And uh, also this coming Saturday night, actually uh, it's gonna start Friday evening. I don't know if any of you ever heard about this. It's called The Return. And it's a call to repentance for our nation it's a call to prayer. Uh, we've already sent out one of the uh, prayer guide days uh, through our email, and you'll be getting one every day because it's 10 days of prayer before that starts. And Paul has got those set up to go out uh, every day, and you'll be able to, to follow the prayer guide for that and prepare your heart uh, for that uh, session. We're going to have it streaming live here. They're doing that in Washington, D.C., and it's going to be, a, a from all I can read and all I've looked at, it's going to be a great big event. It's going to be a lot of people up there. And they're going to have numerous speakers, and uh, it's just going to be wonderful. And they're going to have worship times, and uh, Don Moen is going to be leading the worship. And, of course, Pat and Chuck's son plays with Don Moen, so he's going to be up there a part of that. And I know that they've been working very hard to get all that prepared and we need to continue to pray for them but uh, we're going to be here uh, Saturday this coming Saturday from 5 to 7 30 and we're going to be streaming the last session live now the 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 event goes on it starts Saturday I mean Friday evening then starts early Saturday morning it goes all through the day well there's no way we could do that all day here but we decided to to have the live um, our live streaming here from 5 to 7 30 that's the very last session of the day 
And if you'd like to come, you can do that. If you'd like to watch that at home all day, you can go to their website, thereturn.org, I believe it is, and you can sign up and you can watch it on your uh, computer or on your smart TV. You can even put it there and you can watch those sessions all day long if you'd like to do that. So you can sign up individually as we have signed up as a church to, to host the event. I hope that you'll consider doing that and uh, follow through that with all of that. There's going to be a lot of time of worship, a lot of time of prayer, and then there's going to be some fantastic speakers that are lined up to speak as well. So uh, Jonathan Kahn, I think, is going to be doing the last message. It's a prophetic message, and uh, that's going to be on Saturday evening. So we're going to meet uh, starting at 5 o'clock. We'll be... It'll be up on the screen, and we'll be watching that from 5 to 7.30, and that's when it's supposed to end, uh, depending on, you know, if they're long-winded or not, you know, how that is. But um, uh, anyway, uh, we're going to be here for that last session, and you're invited to come and be a part of that if you'd like, and uh, we're, we'll be here with it up on the screen, uh, hopefully everything working well. So... I uh, just wanted you to know about that, and if you'd like to sign up, just go to that website, and uh, you can sign up, and you can watch that at home during the day if you'd like to do that. And then don't forget about the Operation Christmas Child. Uh, those are the boxes that we're, we pack for boys and girls that will be shipped all over the world through Samaritan's Purse. And there's a $9 shipping cost that you need to add in the box when you bring it back so that... We, yeah, we can send that with it so they can uh, ship those boxes. And if you feel like that you can't do that this year, then you can go to SamaritansPurse.org and pay $25 and they'll pack a box for you. Or if you just want to give uh, money to the church, we got some people here that'll pack a box, buy stuff and pack a box for you. So um, whatever you like to do, but we hope that you will... Uh, support this. We've been doing this for several years and the boxes are in the ladies Sunday school class at the end of the hallway here and I know that there was a couple of young, uh, good looking young people that were handing out some boxes this morning and people were coming in. Isn't that right Tommy? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, uh, if you'd like to do that please get one. All right well thank y'all for being here this morning. It's so good to see you. Um, I hope that you will uh, let the Lord speak to your heart today. Just turn around and wave at somebody and greet everybody, okay? Please stand and join us as we continue in worship this morning. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. All right, now you know it. Rightfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Take my life. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my heart and form 
one more. To yours, to yours, oh Lord. And all of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy me with your love. And all I have in you is more than enough. of life, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know, you're my reward worth living for, still more awesome than I know, and all of you is more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and Sacrifice of greatest price, still more awesome than I know. You're my coming king, you are everything, still more awesome than I know. And all of you is more than enough for all of me, for every thirst and every satisfy me with your love and all I have in you more than all I want more than all I need you are more than enough for me more than all I know more than all I can say you are more than enough and all of you all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you and all of you is more than enough all of Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour. I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep. Grace is more where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ. Lord, I need you. 
trust on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my right My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Pray with me, please. Oh Lord, we do need you. More and more every hour, every day. We just need you. Come and be our everything. Come and fill us, Lord. We ask your blessing on the rest of this service, Lord. May everything that we say and do, may it be to your glory. And we ask all this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Today we're going to be looking in the book of Romans chapter 2 and going into chapter 3. I'm just going to read the last few verses of chapter 2 this morning and then we'll look at the other. Actually, I'm going to read down th through verse 24 of chapter 2 and then we'll look at the rest of the verses as we go through uh, the message. So if you'd open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. And reading down through verse number 24. Romans chapter 2 beginning in verse number 17. Paul says, Indeed you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor uh, idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking of the law? For the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now in this section of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, remember I've told you that he's become like a prosecuting attorney. And one by one, he has, he's been assembling all, the, um, all of the human race before the judgment bar of God, and he demonstrates through this section that basically we are all, the whole world is guilty before God, and that 
we're all in desperate need of a savior. Well, today he brings before the justice bar of God, the religious person. Verse 17, he says, indeed, you are called a Jew. Now, if we really want to try to make that apply to us this morning, what we need to do is kind of insert a little bit of something else there to make it make it a little bit more understandable to us. You could read, indeed you are called a religious person, or indeed you are called a church member, or indeed you are called a member of First Baptist Church. You can kind of, it kind of becomes more understandable to us if you say it like that. See, it's possible for a person to have religion, but not have redemption. Now what I mean by that, that it's possible for a person to join a church, to attend the services, to even uh, be baptized and do all those things, and yet not really know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. See, mere profession is not enough. There has to be possession. You have to possess the Lord Jesus. It has to be real in your heart and in your life. Well, my purpose today is not to unsettle anyone in your faith. But my purpose today is to reach maybe to that individual who perhaps is sitting here this morning that you've made a profession of faith and uh, maybe you've joined the church and maybe you've even been baptized, but yet you're really not a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be uh, a member of a church and not be born again. We have approximately 416 members uh, in our fellowship here. And I raise the question, have all, have all of these people whose names are on our roll uh, really been born again? Are they really going to heaven when they die? And I think that's what Paul is dealing with here when he's looking at this and he's talking about the Jewish people. He's bringing uh, basically the unsaved person before the God's justice and he's saying to them you're guilty and you're in desperate need of a savior there are several things I want to call your attention to this morning first of all is that the religious person's religion <laughs> because if you look at verses 17 through 24 you have a picture here of a person who is religious <clears throat> but they really are not saved they really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ in Paul's day, in the midst of all of the dark paganism of that time, it really was an advantage to be born a Jew because you lived in an atmosphere of religious things. And I want you to see that, first of all, in their boasting. He says in verse 17, you rest on the law and you make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. You see, a Jewish person who was brought up in the atmosphere of the great temple in Jerusalem or the local synagogues in their communities. They were blessed to have the Old Testament scriptures that they could uh, hear, read, or read themselves. And in the atmosphere of those religious things, Paul says that is a great advantage to you. And I think even here today about some of you here this morning, you've been brought up in an atmosphere of the church maybe all your life. You've been brought up in the atmosphere, a lot of you, in First Baptist Church. I mean, your daddy may have been a deacon. Your mama may have been a Sunday school teacher. You've been hearing beautiful music and listening to the Bible preach. And so a religious atmosphere is not foreign to you. You see, if you've been brought up in the atmosphere of spiritual things, that's really an advantage to you because you know what God requires and you know what God wants for your life. Um, but there are some people who've been brought up in this familiar surrounding spiritually, but they just kind of take it for granted. They get so familiar with it, it just, they just take it for granted. Familiarity does breed contempt sometimes, you know, as the old saying goes. And I'm afraid that's what happens to some people who are brought up in the atmosphere of the church. They hear about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that he shed at Calvary's cross. They hear the songs that are 
uh, sung every Sunday. They listen to the Word of God preached. They're in uh, a spiritual atmosphere, and yet after a while they just begin to take it for granted. And so you see, these people who are members of the fellowship but unsaved, they make their boast in spiritual things, but those spiritual things don't really grip their heart. They just don't grip their heart. They get familiar to them, but yet they're not real to them and they're not very personal to them. But not only they're boasting, they look at their teaching, verse 19, he says, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, and an instructor of, of the foolish, and a teacher of babes. Now the Jewish people had been given the assignment by God to teach the rest of the world about how wonderful of God he is and what he could do in their lives. And so they began to take pride in that. They began to take pride in the fact that God had given them that assignment. In fact, notice here that the Jews, what, the, what they thought about the Gentiles. Look at what he called them. He referred to them as blind in darkness, foolish in babes. That's how they looked down their noses at those who were Gentiles. They, in that day that they lived in, they took that sacred responsibility to tell other people about God and they allowed it to make religious snobs out of them. And they developed religious cliques and they looked down their noses at those who didn't know what they knew. Now, Unfortunately, the same thing happens right here in America. The same thing happens in churches in our land. I mean, we, have, we too have been assigned to be witnesses about God all over the world. That's the Great Commission. We've been given that assignment. And yet, it's our responsibility to demonstrate uh, by the caliber of our own behavior and our own consistency, uh, the consistency of our own verbal testimony, that Christ is the Savior of the world and that all who will come to him can be born again and can be truly saved. But if you're not careful, you can get proud of that fact, that the fact that you belong to a Bible-believing, a Bible-preaching church, and yet you never really consistently share the gospel with anyone. You know that that's what we're called to do. You know that's what the assignment that God has given to us. But yet, you never do it. And that's what happened to the Jewish people. And I think that's what happens in our churches today. But then look at their pretending in verse 21. He says, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? What he's saying is, do you really practice what you are preaching? Do you really practice that? I mean, if you teach one thing but do another thing, you're not being consistent, are you? See, it's possible for the unsaved church member to hide behind his church membership as a shield to hide his true condition and his behavior. Paul removes the curtain that the unsaved church member hides behind and he accuses them of being inconsistent. Now, look at the series of questions that he begins to ask. He says, you preach a person shouldn't steal, do you steal? I mean, we ought not steal, we know that, we'd all respond, amen, we ought not steal. But, do you lie on your income tax? Do you uh, give God all that's his? Paul says, you preach, you shouldn't steal, but do you steal? And then he goes to the second question, you say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Now again, we all would say, amen, adultery is wrong. We would say that. There would be no problem with saying that. Jesus said, and he really took it another step. He says, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. And you can... Reverse that, if you look upon a man with adultery in your heart, then you've committed adultery already. I mean, do you look at members of the opposite sex with lust in your heart, with lust in your eyes? And Jesus said, you've already committed adultery. You see, there's some church members who walk around in a, kind of with a secret life. They're walking around and in their minds, they're committing adultery all the time. 
And Paul is saying, do you, you teach you where you're not to do that. Do you do that? Do you do that? And then he moves to the third question. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now we know that idolatry is wrong. We agree that false religions that cause people to fall down to pagan gods and are actually uh, non-existent gods. But we all know that that's wrong. And Paul asks, are you guilty of idolatry? You see, there's more ways of falling down before an idol, I mean, into idolatry, than just falling down and worshiping a, a statue or some kind of idol that's made from hands. Idolatry is anything that you put between yourself and God. And there's some people who make idols out of their home. They make idols out of their job. They make idols out of their football team. They make idols out of a lot of things. So Paul is saying to the unsaved church member, basically you're guilty of pretense because you pretend to be one thing and yet you behave another way and that behavior belies your pretension. You see, it's one thing to go around pretending to be one thing. It's another thing to really be what you are deep down in your heart. And so it's not enough to have your name on the church row. It's not enough to have religion. I'm asking you today, are you truly saved? Are you truly born again? Have you truly repented of your sins and received Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? And look what he says in verses 23 and 24. I think probably two of the most scathing verses in all the Bible. He says, you who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking, through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now let me paraphrase that a minute. It's because of you that unsaved people don't know God or are down on God in some way. Do you know that the greatest hindrance to winning people to Christ in the city of Spring Hill is the inconsistent behavior on the part of those who claim to be Christians? Think about that for a minute. Those who profess to know Christ and yet their lives don't even show Christ in it? He said that is the greatest hindrance that, that people have to come into God. Let me give you an example. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, Nathan came and confronted King David with the sin. And Nathan said to David, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Now think about that. When you sin, you cause the unbeliever to reject God. First of all, you can have religion, but there's a difference between religion and salvation, folks. A big difference. Secondly, I want you to look at the religious person's ritual. If there was ever a group that had ritual, it was the Jews. I mean, their ritual, they went through all these rituals all the time. They had all these feasts and they had all these things that they constantly went through and did. But folks, that did not save them. And our rituals will not save us. You see, I'm talking today, there may be some of you who might say, wait a minute, I've joined the church. My, my family's been members of First Baptist Church for years. I'm involved in Sunday school and I'm involved in the activities of the church. I mean, I've even been baptized. I'm okay, I'm all right. Well, if you had talked to a Jew... The Jewish person would have said, I belong to the chosen people of God. I've been circumcised. I'm all right. Even though their heart was far from God. Look what he says in verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now we know that circumcision to the Jew was a symbol of the covenant with God. The Jews were required to be circumcised because that was an outward token of what their inward relationship of God was to be. And when God made this covenant with Abraham, God said, I want there to be a tangible token of that covenant. It's going to be an outward mark. It will be a surgical ritual. And so the Jews boasted in that. 
I mean, they boasted in that. Now, if you put it in our terminology today, verse 25, it could be read for baptism is indeed profitable if you're truly saved. But if you're not truly saved, your baptism is really unbaptism. You see the point? Look at verses 26 and 27. He says, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physical, physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you even with your written code and circumcision or a transgressor of the law? Paul is saying if a person has never been, I'm, I'm switching it to our world today, if a person has never been baptized but is truly born again, they're better off than the person who is baptized but yet has never been saved. And what he's saying is if your baptism doesn't represent anything that has genuinely taken place in your heart, your baptism is totally useless. Let me give you an example. Patty and I have been married 44 years. I know it's hard to believe because I was five years old, I think, when we got married. Uh, but uh, I wish. But, uh, but you know when you get married, you stand before the pastor, the people who are there you stand before God and when you get married you exchange rings remember did you do that you exchange rings and when you give these rings to one another the wedding ring has value if you're faithful to your spouse but if you're not faithful this ring it's just a piece of metal, or in my case, it's just a piece of silicone. Uh, that's, all it's it. that's all it is. I mean, it has no value if you're not faithful. So, Paul is saying here that the same thing is true about your baptism. Your baptism has meaning if it's an outward symbol of an inward experience. But my friend, if you've never truly been born again, and and you went down into the baptismal waters and then you came up, all in the world happened to you is that you got wet. That's it. You just got wet. And that's the end of the matter. So you see, what I'm trying to say is ritual is not enough. Religion won't save you and ritual will not save you. Look at verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is outwardly, in other words, just because you have the outward symbol, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. He's saying here ritual means something if it represents the inward reality. But if it doesn't represent the inward reality, then it doesn't mean a thing. Thirdly, I want you to look at the religious person's reasoning. And we're moving down into chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now we ask the question, how does an unsaved member of the church, what's their reasoning? What's their reason in their mind? And when you read these verses, you'll find that it's very difficult for the unsaved church member to truly come to grips with his own unsaved condition. So Paul basically asked three, three questions. Look at verse number 1. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Now, again, I'm going to try to switch that around, bring it up to date. What advantage is there to being a church member, or what value is there in baptism? In other words, if, if all you say is true, then what's the good of being in the atmosphere of these spiritual things? Is there any advantage to it? And Paul answers that question in verse 2. He says, much in every way. Chiefly because of them who were committed the oracles of God. Paul is saying there is a great advantage to being in the atmosphere of the church. And I'll tell you why. Because we have given to us the word of God. We have the Bible. Do you know that there's thousands of people in the world that don't have a Bible? They don't have it. There was a time in history in, in our world that when the only Bible was in the community and it would be in the church and most of the time it was chained to the pulpit so someone would steal it. 
And the only time you could hear it was when the pastor got up and preached it in the, in the service. But if you have a Bible and it's in front of you, listen, there's a great advantage to that because you might be reading through the Bible one day and read a verse of scripture that the Lord speaks to your heart, grips your heart and convicts you and you might come to Jesus because of that. There's a chance you might hear a message today and really listen for the first time and let it sink into your heart and your life and hear what the Word of God has to say. Folks, listen, because there is a Bible, there is hope for you today. There is hope for that unsaved person. He said, you have the oracles of God. But now there's a side question, not the second question, but a side question. Preacher, we've got a Bible. What, what if folks didn't believe it? What if people failed to read the Bible? Well, look at what he says in verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? What he's saying here, you've got a Bible, but you haven't read it. You haven't heeded it. Does that cancel the faithfulness of God? And he says in verse 4, certainly not. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. Listen, it doesn't matter how you respond to the word of God. God is still true. The promises of God do, do not fail. They are still in effect, even though you may not choose to believe the word of God. Just because you choose not to believe the word of God doesn't mean that God is a liar and that God's word is not true. Folks, God's word is true no matter what you think. It doesn't matter who may have rejected the Lord. Jesus will still save anyone who will repent of their sin and by faith come to him. Then he quotes David from Psalm 51. He says, that is, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. In Psalm 51, David had sinned. And he came and he confessed his sin to God. And David basically was saying to God, the failure was in me, not in God. The failure was in me, not God. All right, now in verse 5, there's a second question. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? Now, I'm going to paraphrase that because that's a little bit difficult to understand, I think. He said, he's basically saying, if our sin makes the grace of God look much greater, then why does God judge us for being sinners? In other words, their, their reasoning is, if I'm a sinner and I'm making God's, uh, you know, grace look greater, isn't that a good thing? I'll just sin more and because God's forgiven me, his grace will be greater. You know, there's some people that reason that way. Is God fair to judge me because of my sin when I'm trying to make his grace look greater? There's people who reason that way all the time. I know I ought not do what I do, but, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do it because, you know, I know that God's going to forgive me and his grace is just going to seem greater to people. You ever heard someone say that? Have you ever kind of heard, maybe they didn't say, exactly say it that way, but yeah, in their talk they kind of... That's what they meant. People reason that way all the time. But Paul comes back and he says in verse 6, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? God is going to judge sin, folks. It doesn't matter who commits it. Verses 7 and 8. For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. So here's the third question. Why then don't we sin so that good will come from our sin? And it's the old argument that uh, the end justifies the mean. It's the argument that situation, situation ethics uses today. Situation ethics say, says that it's all right to do something that's wrong if good will come out of it. Well, it's the old argument, you know, let's do evil in order that good may come. Or, you know, if our bad makes God look good, let's do worse so God will look better. But Paul says, their condemnation is just. What he's saying is, if you reason that way, it's a good indication that you've really never been born again. You've never been saved. And the burden of my heart today is that 
It's not enough for you to have religion. You've got to be say, I've heard people say, you know, that person just needs a good dose of religion. No, they don't. They need a good dose of Jesus. They need a good dose of Jesus. It's not enough for you to even have been baptized. You have to be saved. You have to be saved. You have to know Christ. You have to know him in your life and in your heart. I mean, it's not enough reason that you can live any way you want to and say, well, I'm still a Christian. Folks, listen, if you're born again, you're not going to want to live the way you want to live. You're going to want to live the way Christ wants you to live. You know, I've heard people say, I, I worked with a guy in the coal mines years ago, and one night we were talking, and he was, um, he was just, I'm not even going to describe him, but he was pathetic. But uh, he said, you know, he says, I'd, I think if I ever wanted to be a Christian, I would be a Baptist. And I said, why? He said, because y'all believe once saved, always saved. I could just get saved and do anything I wanted to do. I said, do you really believe that? Well, yeah, that's what y'all believe. I said, no, that's not what I believe. I don't believe that. I said, I believe once saved, always saved. I believe in the, you know, that we're saved eternally. But when you get saved, you're not going to want to live like that. Because God's got his Holy Spirit inside of you. And he's going to be convicting you every time you start trying to live like that. You're not, he, God's not pleased when you live the way you want to live. He wants you to live the way he's told you to live in his word. The way his spirit is directing you. That's the way God wants you to live. He says, ah. He says, if I'm saved, once saved, always saved. I can just do anything I want to. I said, well, maybe you need to really get saved. And I said, you'll find out it's different. Because when the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you, it's not the way you think it is. It's something totally, totally different. So let me ask you this morning, have you truly been saved? Well, preacher, I'll walk down the aisle of the church. No, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Well, preacher, I, I joined the church. My name's on the roll. Well, that's not what I'm asking you. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Well, well I got baptized. I'm not asking you that. My question to you this morning is, do you really know that the Lord Jesus is the Savior of your soul? He's the Lord of your life. Do you know that? Have you truly been born again? Have you truly been saved? If you don't know that this morning, my prayer is that you'll come and receive him as Lord of your life. Not just Savior of your life. There's some people who want him as their Savior, but they don't want to make him Lord. Listen, he cannot be your Savior if he's not, first of all, your Lord. He's got to be your Lord. Is he the Lord of your life? Do you know him? Don't be in a position where you think, well, I was raised in the church. I've been around the church all my life. And somehow you think that because you've been in the church all your life and you've gone through all the steps that God's going to welcome you into heaven and you, yet you don't really know Jesus in your life. Folks, listen. There's going to be a lot of people. I think Billy Graham said that about 50% of the church people were lost because they probably didn't really know Jesus. I hope that you're not one of those 50% if that's true. I don't know that that's true, but if it is, that's a scary thing. Because there's a lot of people fooled into thinking that they're saved when they're really, all they've been is just a member of a church. Make it real in your life. And again, I'm not trying to unsettle, if you're, unsettle you if you're truly a believer. If you're a truly believer, you should know and have confidence in that. But if you don't know for sure... Listen, one day you're going to stand before the judgment bar of God. And like Paul is doing here, he's saying, it's not enough just to be religious. You've got to really know the Lord Jesus in your life. Do you know him this morning? If not, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that this morning as Jonathan comes. And